when it happened, I thought he's a he runs a wrestling school. He gets in the ring, and he was like, "Holy fuck! Like, how did you get Eddie to get in the ring?" And I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "He hasn't been in the ring since like fucking Rick Root. That group I just said, myself, Ken, Aries, ODB, uh, Punk, and Cabana, were the only ones that gave a fuck. So we tried really hard. We helped each other out, and and they started doing it first. They they really got good exposure on the East Coast. Then Punk got in good with Ring of Honor, and I, I and then like I remember like Punk was like, "What a fucking who is this guy? Like, what a fucking dipshit." And, and, like, he never said it to me, but he just treated me like a complete jabroni, which I would do the exact same thing to somebody who hasn't had a match who had a website. And uh, and I just didn't know why. I was like, why is this guy, like, totally jabroni me for no reason? I don't even know him. Kind of like ECW did. Even though ECW was a smaller audience of the biggest, biggest show, it was so different that it had to develop a fan base. And, and that happened with Punk from day one. Like, he's really, really talented, but... If you never see him wrestle, just looking at his 8x10 or when he comes out and the way he carries himself, there's nobody else like him. Because he's not the kind of guy that Vince McMahon would ever book on top, and everybody coming up tries to emulate the guy Vince McMahon would put on top. So he always stood out, and that's why, like, once I understood how the business works, I always knew as soon as he gets a break, he'll be fucking golden. And it happened everywhere. Like, granted, it's a much smaller scale, but every little shitty independent he went for, after two or three shows, he was the hottest guy on the card. Like, I got signed in 2004, and in 2003, I want to say I had, like, 16 uh, dark matches for them. I remember thinking, like, what the fuck? Like, why am I doing so many fucking dark matches? Like, like give me a job or tell me to fucking stop coming back. Right. That's when Dr. Tom was like, all right, this fucking kid, like, he comes in all the time. He has great matches. Fucking, you guys give him a fucking standing ovation in the gorilla position. Like, make him a fucking manager. If he's too small, make him a manager. And then it all, and they offered me a job, and it all came together, and, like, 30 days. Gerald Briscoe would like take me right up to the fucking uh, Sergeant Slaughter and be like, you know, Sean's here. Remember he had that great match in Chicago? Oh yeah. And then Sarge would take like, they, they just had the names, you know? So they, they're just, sometimes these guys need to get squashed. And then, and Bubba told us, he said, look, they're putting us as match to fuck us. They want to fuck with us and tell us that fucking they don't need us and blah. He's like, we're going to go out there. We're going to fucking tear the house down. And me, Bubba, Devon and Aries had a fucking fantastic match. And we all walked back to Gorilla together, and Vince went to Bubba. He says, I apologize. Like, it was wrong of us to put you in the dark match. And Bubba looked right at him and said, it's a shame it wasn't on Raw. And he fucked off. And I was like, wow. I that was, it, yeah, it, it, I got signed, and two weeks later, I was doing Raw house shows. Uh, three weeks later, we were doing Raw dark matches. And, like, in four weeks, we were in Stamford taping vignettes. You know, traveling and training with, like, Benoit. And, like, you know, at the time, he was, like, just right off, like, a hot title run. And... Fucking hanging out with Randy and fucking throwing firecrackers out of fucking cars and shit. Like, right. It, I, I, it was as any other rock, locker room I'd ever been. Everybody, everybody fucked with them. Fucking uh, Bradshaw, Bob Holly. Um, what are some of the things they would do to them? They would just. They, I, can't even, I can't even think of specifics. I, I remember like one time we were in Japan somewhere and they called us to the fucking bar and it was like, it was like fucking Bradshaw, Taker, like uh, Bob, Charlie Haas, a few other guys. And they told us to sit down, and then like uh, like Jericho right away like knew what was going on, and then he was just like, "Do you need both of them?" And then they're like, "No, just the big one." He's like, "Come with me," and he's grabbed me, and me and Chris fucked off, went to Rapungi, and like did whatever. But like I don't even know what happened. And then like like there was one time where fucking like he he was using the camel clutch as a finisher, and Eddie was using it too. And I remember Kurt like. Kurt never knew that he was, like, a fucking top guy. <laughs> he always thought he was, like, everybody else. And he didn't understand that people couldn't do what he did. And Kurt went up to Mark, and he was like, hey, man, like, you got to protect your finish. Like, if, if someone else is going to do the ankle lock, I'm going to say something. And Mark, not knowing any better, went to Eddie and was like, hey, like, you know, like, you do the camel clutch in the middle of all your matches. I'm kind of using it as a finish. And he's like, do you know who invented the camel clutch? And he's like, yeah, like, Iron Sheik. He's like, no, Iron Sheik used it. Like, my dad invented it. Yeah, when you first met Vince. <laughs> the first time I met him, we did a pre-tape. And then he was watching the fucking playback. And then he was just like, do you guys see what's wrong here? And then fucking nobody said anything. And he just fucking screamed at the top of his lungs. Do you guys see what the fuck is wrong here? And me and Mark are just fucking shaking. I have no idea. He's like, there's a fucking cable in the background. It was the production guys. Like, there was a wire, like, hanging back behind us where we were standing. Right. Nobody knows you guys are on the show. We're going to bring back Eugene. And then you guys are going to get heat on Eugene. And then Hogan's going to come out for the same. And we're like, holy shit, like, we had no idea that was going to happen. I remember the coolest part was, like, for me, I should say, was we were there, and, like, you know, Pat's always Hulk's agent, so Pat does all his segments and stuff. And they had the thing pretty much be Hassan and Hogan. And then, like, Pat was just in there, like, why? Fucking, the manager's all the fucking heat. Like, 
He said fucking right away, fucking shit can Muhammad and have Hulk and, and Devari do all this shit. So they pretty much shit canned the segment to Mark getting heat on fucking Eugene. H Hogan coming in and pitching out Eugene and then me doing the whole comeback with Hulk and everything. I was right. actually at the gym with Molly Holly and they call me and they're like, do you travel with wrestling gear? I was like, yeah, I always just keep my gear in my bag. They're like, okay, well, you're having a match tonight. I was like, well, that's cool because that was my first match too on Raw. Like I'd been wrestling on the house shows. We've been doing tag matches, but I hadn't done anything on TV. And, uh, and I was like, who am I working with? I was like, oh, you're, you're working with Sean Knight. I was like, wow, that's fucking crazy. And another thing too is like he's one of like my childhood heroes and like we got along well and I always like sit and chat with him and annoyed him in the dressing room and stuff and like uh, and then afterwards they're like oh you're actually going up I was like what like <laughs> what are you talking about like, yeah you're gonna beat him tonight like oh and then like you guys are gonna work for the next four weeks and you guys have a pay per view match together I was like this is fucking retarded like we would be in the ring and like he would like I would pick him up for, like a fucking slam and I'd fucking swing him up and throw him down. And then, like, because he's working with me. And then fucking Mark would go wrestle him, and he just fucking sandbagged oh, Mark. Yeah. He's just picking up, like, a sidewalk slam, and, like, Mark's, like, fucking a foot taller than me, like, 300 pounds heavier than me. He gets, like, an inch off the ground, and they topple over and fucking fall over. And then at the end of the night, we were trying to settle up our checks, like, he's been taken care of. Like, who? It was, like, that seven-foot guy, Undertaker, <laughs> he fucking paid it, like, four hours ago. I was like, wow. And that was everywhere. Like, he could stay with us all night, and he'd pick it up, or he'd show up for fucking five minutes and go somewhere else, and he'd pick up the tab. I'm not the best fucking wrestler in the world, but, like, if you can't fucking bump and feed, like, you shouldn't be under a WWE contract. I know now, if you're a fucking hot character on the show, it's so much better than being a Work. wrestler. If you're not hot. And that last year, which pretty much le led to me leaving WWE, that 2007, 2008 year, like, I was wrestling every fucking show, every house show and stuff, but it sucked. It was like, it was so shitty. And I was going like, oh my God, when I was... Just a character on the show, I was working with Steve Austin and Roddy Piper and fucking Hogan and Sean and fucking all these, Cena, Kurt, Mark, Holly, you know, and then like now I'm a wrestler and like, you know, I, I don't speak ill of him because I, I, I look up to him with the fucking the highest regards in the world, but like I'm wrestling fucking super crazy on Sunday Night Heat. And I'm going like, fuck, like I would, at that point, I was like, I, I would much rather be a character. I would much rather be, you know, Mr. McMahon than Stevie Richards. Well, it's Regal's first night on Raw, like he can't. You can't have a guy lose his first night back on Raw. I go, okay. And they put me in there. I was like, it's my first night too. What the fuck? But, I, you know, I was, I was much happier fucking doing a job to Jeff on Raw than fucking going over on Santino. At that point in time, and Muda was like, me and you, like, whole tour. And I didn't get it at first. Like, wow, like, maybe I'm really good. Maybe he likes me or something. But then I found out he was so fucking beat up that he could only do the fucking, right? yeah, yeah, he could only do the phony baloney American style. So I told the flight attendant, I'm like, that guy standing right there, his name is Billy Gunn, and you know, it's his 65th birthday or something today. Would you mind getting on the PA and, and wishing him a happy birthday and having everyone like sing along? Like, it would really make him feel good. Like, yeah, sure. So they got on the, the ladies, like, just like, you know, seatbelt, oxygen mask, blah, blah, blah. She's like, and ladies and gentlemen, we want to say happy 65th birthday to Billy Gunn if everyone doesn't mind singing along. Happy birthday. And that's what I tried to tell him. He fucking said, you can't wear your turban anymore. And he took me out of my fucking like Sabu pants and everything. And he was just trying to, pretty much everything that made me stand out, he was trying to fucking strip. And I was going like, fuck, this contract, I, you just fucking told me to sign because you compensate me for being on TV and I'm not on TV anymore. That was the beginning of me and Russo but arguing because he was fucking with my money. And like, I felt like if he was my boss when I signed this contract, if I got a new boss, I should be able to do a new contract. Some of the guys were looking for some weed and something got lost in translation about they wanted to get high and fucking there's a knock on our hotel room and one of the fucking Indian guys brings us a fucking brick of black tar heroin. One time, he missed the house show because he went to the wrong arena. Like, he went to the wrong venue. Like, I think in his GPS, he put, like... Like, it was supposed to be, like, Michigan. He put in Missouri, like, oh, MI or something. I right, mixed right. up. It was the wrong venue. And the next day, he stood up in the production meeting, was like, Guys, like, I apologize. I'm sorry. I've never missed a show in my life. I fucked up. I'm one of the main event guys. Like, this is unacceptable. I'm sorry. and sorry. And, like... Chris is hanging from his fucking lap machine and his fucking wife and son are dead. I'm like, what? Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, fucking troubles me the most is Lance because I saw Lance Cade literally the weekend before he died and he was so fucked up on drugs. Like, I felt like I should say something, but like, I've seen tons of guys fucked up on drugs tons of times. So it was like, it was like, uh, what do you say? And then like, I, I, but I remember just thinking he was in really, really bad shape. And then the fucking next week he died. And not that if I said anything, it would have made a difference, but I really, really feel like maybe if I said something to somebody, someone could have intervened. Maybe. If I don't change a thing and I'm never in the right place at the right time, I'll probably never have success again. And if I change everything and I'm in the right place at the right time, I will have success. Like, it's, that's all it is. Like, if, if, they, if no one ever came up with Muhammad Hassan, I would have never been there in the first place.